Chair lays out the following resolution. Secretary will read the resolution. Senate Resolution 638 by Eckhart, commemorating the centennial of the Austin branch of the American Association of University Women. Chair recognizes Senator Eckhart on the resolution. Thank you so much, Mr. President and members. Where are my? There y'all are. Uh, the Austin branch of the American Association of University Women is celebrating its 100th anniversary, and I'm so honored to have members with us today. Ann Barrisley, Jackie Hardy, and Shirlene Justice. So great to have y'all up there. First started in 1881, the AAUW began as a small group of female college students because there were so few female college students uh, with the shared goal of promoting women in the workplace. My own father told me stories about how his aunt lived with them on San Gabriel and 28th as one of the only female college students at the University of Texas back in the teens. Um, the teens of the previous century. <laughs> Uh, the organization's mission is to advance gender equity and encouraging young women to pursue degrees of higher education and what a success we've seen in that mission with 58% of college students being women in the United States today. The Austin branch of the AAUW has been a cornerstone of the Austin community. They were involved in founding the city's first public library and junior college, which we now know as the Austin Community College, and created both an endowment fund and scholarship for doctoral students at UT and female students at the Austin Community College. They were instrumental in establishing a well baby clinic and the Chalmers Nursery School, which is currently named the Main Spring School and has served underprivileged children in our community since 1941, members. And let me put that in context. Currently, 40% of women in the United States have college degrees. Back in 1941, less than 4% of women had college degrees. More recently, the Austin AAUW was participating in multiple equal pay days at the Capitol, encouraging young women to enter into STEM education through their support of Girl Start and garnered support for Title IX in the Austin community. The AAUW continues to uplift women in the Austin community in so many ways. Please join me in welcoming and applauding these trailblazers. I move adoption of the resolution. Member Senator Eckhart moves adoption of the resolution. Is there objection? Here, Chair, hears none. The resolution is adopted. Thank you for joining us today.
Chair lays out the following resolution. Secretary will read the resolution. Senate Resolution 629 by Creighton. Whereas the Senate of the State of Texas is pleased to recognize Judge Wayne Mack on his outstanding service as Justice of the Peace in Montgomery County. And whereas Judge Mack took office as a county judge on May 1, 2014, and he has faithfully served the residents of Montgomery County for nearly a decade. A graduate of Jackson College of Ministries in the Lone Star College Police Academy, he previously served with the Conroe Police Department as a Deputy Reserve Constable and as the Reserve Unit Supervisor. Judge Mack is dedicated to upholding the law and he presides over Montgomery County Precinct 1 with the highest standards of judicial conduct. And whereas shortly after his election to the bench, Judge Mack established a chaplaincy program of clergy and laity from several faiths and denominations that assist law enforcement officers who are working with community members during times of crisis and tragedy. This program has greatly expanded over the past eight years and has provided spiritual guidance and solace to countless individuals and law enforcement officials. And whereas an esteemed public servant and a highly respected leader in the Montgomery County community, Judge Mack has given generously of his time and energy to benefit numerous groups and causes, including Montgomery County Youth Services, the Women's Center, and Children's Safe Harbor. He has served in leadership roles with such organizations as Montgomery County United Way, the Conroe Noon Lions Club, the Friendship Center, and the Conroe Family Young Men's Christian Association. And whereas throughout his more than 20 years as a peace officer and justice of the peace, Judge Mack has worked tirelessly to serve the families and youth of Montgomery County. His efforts and accomplishments have provided an invaluable benefit to the county and its residents, and he has made a positive difference in the lives of many. Now therefore be it resolved that the Senate of the State of Texas, 88th Legislature, hereby commend Judge Wayne Mack on his distinguished career and service to Montgomery County and extend to him best wishes for the future. Senator Creighton, you're recognized on the resolution. No. Uh, Mr. President and members, uh, today I'm recognizing a man whose professional life has been dedicated to serving the public and upholding the law, Judge Wayne Mack. Hey, Judge, good to have you here. Judge Mack's life has been, uh, had started out, and his professional career started out as a custodian. And he began his career uh, working uh, with a work ethic that propelled him to be one of the most esteemed judges in the state today. With his extensive background in law enforcement, Judge Mack brought a unique perspective to the bench. He upholds the law, he's fair and impartial, he works with everyone that needs help, helping them to find a better path. And Judge, you've helped so many to find a better path. His steadfast commitment to his roles and his ability to navigate through the demanding task are truly inspirational for our Montgomery County community. Judge Max is unapologetic about his commitment to religious freedom established by an innovative practice of incorporating prayer offered by volunteer chaplains from a multitude of religious backgrounds into his court proceedings, always showing his belief in unity, diversity, and religious freedom. Judge Mack's chaplaincy program was born out of a sincere desire to provide comfort and counsel to grieving families during times of immense sorrow. And Judge, you have done that. Judge Mack's a champion of empowering people and inspiring people. Anyone who's attended his annual prayer breakfast knows that he inspires thousands of Texans from every faith. And Judge, over the years, there is no doubt there have been thousands and thousands at your prayer breakfast. It is just something to witness and something to celebrate uh, as you bring so many together. Judge Mack lifts people up and makes us all want to be better. Over the past 24 years, the judge has shown an unwavering dedication to our community in Montgomery County, and it's my hope, Judge, that you continue that for many, many years. 
Back home, you're advancing access to mental health services. Thank you for your advocacy this session uh, that has made a major difference and will show in this Texas state budget that we are producing uh, here at the finish line, thanks to Chairman Huffman. And raising, Judge, you've raised critical funds for social services and hosting, again, one of the, the largest prayer break, breakfasts uh, in the state, if not <laughs> in this part of the nation. Uh, you have brought so many leaders together uh, that have uh, since gone on it with those relationships built to solve so many needs locally and statewide. Members, he did all of this while fighting to allow prayer in his courtroom after he was attacked and sued for exactly uh, the chaplaincy program that I mentioned before. And through years of litigation and all the way to the Fifth Circuit, Judge Mack won. And with First Liberty Institute and others, First Liberty and others representing uh, Judge, I just want to say congratulations to carrying forward and pushing forward with what you know to be right and carrying out your life on the side of light in the face of darkness. We all celebrate you for that. Uh, members, it's a privilege to have the judge and his beautiful wife, Mindy, here. Uh, and you are just local treasures at home, certainly uh, uh, Texas treasures and an example of the American dream. And the entire state of Texas is better off for your service. So, members, if you can join me in recognizing a true Texan, Judge Wayne Mack. Senator Nichols, you're recognized on the resolution. I uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator Creighton, very much for bringing this resolution. I, I did not actually realize they were going to be here today, but I saw that whole group up there when I first got here, went over there and had a long dialogue. But uh, we love you, Judge, and, and your wife. They are always a team. They're an amazing force to be reckoned with in Montgomery County for good. I never went of any place of significance in Montgomery County where there was a group that Judge Mack and his wife were not there together. Uh, we appreciate you, Judge, and we appreciate the work you've done, have done over the past and continue to do. And uh, thank you for your friendship. Um, and so thank you very much, Senator Creighton. Thank you, Senator Nichols. Senator Colcorst on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President and members. My good fortune was that during redistricting, I was, um, I, I, I was able to attain part of Montgomery County. I'd always heard of Judge Mack, uh, and we knew each other kind of, you know, briefly. Uh, but truly, I was able to see he and his family and their involvement, his beautiful wife, and all that they do. And I think Senator Creighton, I, I want to thank you for bringing this resolution. It is not often that we pause to say to people, thank you for your service, unwavering. And, and whenever I see him, there is something about him that brings about joy and happiness. And I think that that's his faith in the Lord and, and what he is able to, to as a public servant, um, bring to all of the people you said Texas is better because of his service truly judge that is a absolute and the Lord is using you in incredible ways my opportunity um, other than Montgomery County is our work that we're doing on mental health uh, he, he again is unwavering on getting people help so that they may live out their fulfillment and why the Lord sent them here and so I just want to say Thank you. We are so grateful for what you do, not just in Montgomery County, but, but how it permeates from Montgomery County. You are the example we should all strive to be in being a public servant, truly. Thank you all. Thank you to the family for letting him serve. Senator Betancourt on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Creighton. 
uh, for uh, making uh, for bringing the resolution because this uh, this is the uh, Moco triangle now right here okay in the Senate. Don't mess with MoCo because Robert got kicked up country to parts unknown, but we, we've taken his place. And I guess, uh, Judge Mack, I, would there be a, a wee bit of room for a, a Aggie Catholic senator at your prayer breakfast? I, maybe? A wee bit of room? Well, I gather because you're bringing in Protestants because you're going to get one. you got a Lutheran back here as well. And uh, I could go on about uh, Mork and Mindy jokes. I'm sure you've heard those before, Mindy. But anyway, wonderful television show. But more importantly, your reality, what you lived, is awesome. Because, Judge, not many people would have stood up for prayer in a courtroom and had to fight it all the way up the ladder. But Judge Wayne Mack did. And that means, you know, you're not only right upstairs, okay, you're right everywhere. So thank you so much. You've got it. Pra you know, praise them too. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Betancourt. Senator Creighton to close. Judge, thank you for, for uh, what you do day in and day out. Uh, thank you sh for showing uh, what it means for, uh, you, you know, Texas to understand how a justice of the peace in Texas handles his business and takes care of his community. Uh, we're proud of all of our justice of the peace, uh, but uh, it, you are uh, the embodiment of uh, presiding over the people's court. And just thank you for that and the history behind it and, and what it reflects with your service going forward. We're so proud of you, proud of Mindy, uh, proud of you being here, and just uh, thank you again for all that you do. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. President. Member Senator Creighton moves adoption of the resolution. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Resolution is adopted. Thank you.
Members, can I clear the floor and everyone take their seats, all guests off the floor? We're going to have a moment in silence in two minutes for the victims of Uvalde. The governor has, has asked us to do that at 11.30. Thank you, members. We are two minutes away from that, so... Members, if everyone would rise. And in the gallery, please. Thank you. Uh, this moment of silence for the tragedy in Uvalde and the families and the victims. Thank you, members. Members, we have a memorial resolution. The chair lays out the following resolution. The secretary will read the resolution. Senate Resolution 618 by Campbell et al. In memory of Billy Joe Red McCombs. Senator Campbell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, today the Senate of the State of Texas celebrates the life of Billy Joe Red McCombs, a celebrated Texas entrepreneur and philanthropist who died February the 19th, 2023, at the age of 95. Joining us today in the Texas Senate are members of the McCombs family, Marcia Shields, his daughter, Anna Shields Turner, granddaughter, Joseph Shields, grandson, 
and Carson Ruby, grandson. To commemorate this special occasion, I have a flag that was flown over the Texas Capitol in honor of Mr. McCombs. I have a, thank you. I have a traditional, I have a traditional uh, Senate gavel that has some special words written on the plaque with its block. And I also have a framed resolution. Go ahead and look that up. Today's framed resolution for you, for the family. Thank you. Billy Joe McCombs, dubbed Red, for his red hair was born October the 19th, 1927, in the small West Texas town of Spur. Spur. Descended from families of farmers, Red was taught the value of hard work when he started his first business at the age of nine. His unstoppable ambition, keen business sense, and larger-than-life personality made him a legend and a figure in American industry and sports management. His philanthropy made the McCombs name synonymous with generosity as well as excellence. A successful football player during high school in Corpus, Red earned a scholarship to attend Southwestern University in Georgetown. He paused his college education to serve his country with distinction in the United States Army for two years before returning to enroll at the University of Texas using the GI Bill. After his time at UT, he returned to Corpus Christi where he sold cars for a Ford dealership and excelled as a salesman through his, this determination and his charisma. He opened his first car dealership at the age of 29 in 1957, and the Red McCombs Automotive Group quickly expanded into an automotive empire. The enterprise became the largest car dealership network in Texas and the sixth largest in the nation. A talented entrepreneur and media visionary, Red purchased the San Antonio radio stations in 1972 with his business partner, Lowry Mays. Together, they found clear, founded Clear Channel Communications. Red's intuition for franchise expansion and advertising helped that company grow into the world's largest radio station conglomerate. In 1973, Red purchased the Dallas Chaparral's basketball team and relocated the team back to to San Antonio under the name of Spurs. Widely recognized as a trailblazer in sports management, Red turned the Spurs and the Denver Nuggets into national powerhouses and played a key role in shaping the modern incarnation of the National Basketball Association. He spent a number of years as owner of the NFL Minnesota Vikings and by investing in Circuit of the Americas, he was also instrumental in the establishment of Formula One racing in Texas. Generous community benefactors, Red and his late wife, Charlene, donated $50 million to the University of Texas Business School, which was renamed the McCombs School of Business, $30 million to the University's MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and immeasurable contributions to UT Athletic Department to include the building of a women's softball field and expansion of the football stadium. He was a champion for education and his philanthropy created countless opportunities for students and young entrepreneurs in Texas. Red had the love and support of his late wife Charlie for almost seven decades. Together they were figureheads in the San Antonio community and were greatly involved in both state and national politics. Red and Charlene were blessed with three daughters, one of whom I've already introduced, Marcia Shields, her, his two other daughters, Linda McCombs and Connie McNabb. Red and Charlene cherished their grandchildren, and now they have 11 great-grandchildren. An esteemed civic leader and a titan of industry, he created more than 400 businesses Red McCombs changed the American automotive trade, professional athletic, athletics, advertising, 
and radio broadcasting. Visiting in the gallery, I know we do have with us today Jay Hartzell, who is president of the University of Texas. You stand up, please. Ethan Burris, who is senior associate dean of the Macomb School of Business. Chris Del Conte, athletic director. And our softball team couldn't be here today because they're on the road. Is that right? We have Margaret Castor, who is an intern in my office. She is actually from the school, Macomb School of Business. How fitting that is. Thank you. There may be some members of the San Antonio Chamber. Go ahead, you can have a seat. There were some members of the Chamber who wanted to be with us today. Not sure if they made it. It was very short notice on my part. Marty Winder, I think he's here, one of Red's best friends. Before I close, Mr. President, I think there may be a couple of other senators who want to say a few words. I'd like them to give brief comments. Senator Zaffarini, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President and members, it is my pleasure to co-author Senate Resolution 618, memorializing my dear and valued friend, Red McCombs. Red was an extraordinary Texan, a giant among men, who impacted not only his cherished community of San Antonio, but also his beloved alma mater, UT Austin, and our great state, and generations of Texans who never met him. A visionary entrepreneur, his success reflected his five-star customer service through his priority of treating customers the way they want to be treated. An avid sports enthusiast, he didn't simply enjoy sports. He brought a wholesome family entertainment to countless sports fans of all ages, particularly those who love the San Antonio Spurs and the Texas Longhorns. I remember vividly Red's taking the time to take my son when he was approximately 10 to the Spurs locker room and introducing him to the legendary David Robinson and then sending him a child-sized David Robinson basketball outfit. Little did he know he was taking a future Macomb's Business School graduate. Equally fondly, I recall how much he enjoyed as a founding partner of Circuit of the Americas, which is in my district, hosting family and friends at the fabulous Formula One race cars. One of my lasting impressions of Red's philanthropy is his passionate speech to UT alumni regarding our Longhorn football team. When we win on Saturday, he said, my phone rings off the wall from donors on Monday. You see, Red didn't simply contribute to his causes, he also raised money for them. His legacy will live forever in the hearts and minds of all who knew and loved him, as well as all through who appreciate and enjoy the red zone at the UT football stadium and those who reap the benefits of MD Anderson and the Red McComb School of Business at UT. Red and Charlene did everything together and their love story envelops Linda, Marsha, and Connie, their eight grandchildren and 11 great grandchildren. They brought much love and joy into each other's lives and I'm confident that these younger generations will extend the McCombs legacy in meaningful and important ways. That legacy will continue to inspire future generations of students, families, entrepreneurs, and community leaders. Mr. President and members, it truly is our privilege for us to gather today to honor Red McCombs, a true pioneer, a legendary Longhorn, and a beloved Texan. Count me among the many who will remember him fondly and treasure memories of our friendship. Above all, we will miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I knew Red McCombs a long time ago. The, um, and I've told this story to Senator Campbell, and she said, you've got to tell this story. So it's, it's a story. But in the, about 40 years ago, some, you, some of you are not old enough to remember that, he and I both loved Texas Longhorns. Now, I'm not talking about the University of Texas football players, Longhorns. I'm talking about the cattle that have the horns and walk around in pastures. And so there weren't many of them 
scattered around the country in the early 1980s. They were like rare coins. And so I was out trying to collect some of these things, and I would go to some of these far-off places and find one or two, and there was Red McCombs. And he started noticing me, and I started noticing him, and we would talk, and we would walk around, and he and I both wanted sometimes the same animal, the same cow, the same steer, the same bull. And um, now I collected them and put them in my pastures, and as an engineer, studied pedigrees, stuff like that. He was interested in those great big long horns. And he would talk about the magnificent horns of those animals, and some of the ones, the young bulls and stuff, how fast. He even measured how many inches of growth they had in a month. It was unbelievable. And so another unusual thing happened at almost the same time. And so while I just enjoyed looking at them in the pasture, sometime in the mid-1980s, the price of oil in Texas shot up and hit a stratospheric new height of $40 a barrel. And there were tycoons and oil tycoons. There was more money made in the oil business than anybody had ever seen in the state of Texas. And they had seen a lot. Now, while I was just reading about that stuff, Red McCombs somehow or another figured out that every one of those new rich oil men needed a Texas Longhorn. And he was going to figure out a way to sell them one. But he did not. So he decided to put a cow sale together. He did not go, Senator Menendez, to San Antonio to sell his cows. He decided to go to Houston, where all the oil people were. He did not go to the livestock deal. He decided to do it a little different way, a step above. And Mr. President, there was a new hotel in Houston called the Galleria. He decided that's where his cow sale needed to be. So he rented the entire grand ballroom of the Galleria Hotel. I don't remember if it was on the second floor or the fourth floor, but it was black tie and second floor, but you had to use the elevators, but it was a black tie and boots, invitation only. He knew me and he knew I liked those cows, so he invited me. But somehow or another, he had gotten the list of every new rich oil person in the state of Texas. They were all invited black tie and boots, including, and then he brought an entire herd of Texas Longhorns up the elevators in the Galleria and had paneling, and he'd bring those cows in one at a time. And he was the auctioneer, and he knew how to sell. So I never saw so many fur coats and diamonds in all my life. There were a lot of rich people in that room. And we were at, I was at a table of eight. It was a typical table of eight. And I didn't know the people that were at my table. We met them when we got there. Uh, there was a couple from Boston. But those cows weren't selling for $5,000 and $10,000. As the drinks flowed and the auction started, he had a, a way of wanting you to buy that animal. And those things started going for $10,000, $25,000, $100,000. I'm talking about 1980s. $500,000 for a cow or a bull coming across that. And even the little cattle guys with the prides had tuxedos and boots on. It was amazing. And if you bought one, you got a bottle of free champagne delivered to your table. And those women were watching the other tables. And they were telling their husbands, well, they got some free champagne. We've got as much money as they do. You, 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 you better buy a cow or buy something. And they did. And, and as more bottles of champagne went out, the prices kept going up. Uh, and um, it, was, it was an amazing sight. I've never seen anything like that before, have not seen since. And there was a young couple sitting at my table that had just moved to Texas, and they were from Boston. Why they got there, I don't know. But they asked me, we have always heard these crazy Texas tales, and we didn't believe it till we saw it. Do, y'all do this? And I'm going, yeah, we do this all the time down here. We do this all the time. And I happened to go to the checkout stand as people were writing checks on the way out, and I saw this one guy write a check. Now, what did I buy? What did I buy? 
They said, you bought a half a bull. I paid a quarter of a million dollars for half a bull? Which half? You know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but it was Red McCombs that put it together. He had that gleam in his eye. He figured out a way to talk those people into purchasing what he and I loved. And that was Texas Longhorn. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks. That's a great Texas story, Senator, and probably epitomizes Red McCombs more than any you could tell. Uh, Senator Sparks, you're recognized. That's a pretty hard story to follow, but I did have the privilege of meeting Red both in political and business circles, and uh, he was truly a person that embodied the Texas persona. Um, you know, he just walked into the room and, you know, commanded respect, but, you know, he was hardworking, he was fearless, he was visionary, but he was also very philanthropic, and, um really, as you've just heard, truly bigger than life. I mean, he leaves a legacy, I think, um, that should inspire all Texans. And it's truly an honor and a privilege to honor him today here in our Texas Senate. Senator Bencourt. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Senator Campbell, for bringing this uh, resolution about a real Texas legend. So fast forward after this uh, this uh, great party, which was the the, the news of of the, of, of H Town, um, a young Aggie Catholic tax assessor gets elected, and I came from industry, petrochemicals and robotics manufacturing, and I got the job as tax assessor, and all I heard was red wants this, and red wants that, and this red's got an idea, and there's a lot of other ways to run a car dealership, et cetera. Uh, and uh, when I got to the office, um, my predecessor had been in office 51 years and an odd number of months a day, so it was Carl Smith, and he went to work with the tax office when Roosevelt was president, and that was Franklin, not Teddy, not quite as far back as Red. But so I cleaned up the office and I had a chance to meet uh, Marsha. I had a chance to meet, you know, Red once. And he said, I introduced him. I said, I was the guy that, uh, Aggie, that cleaned up the tax office. And he said, oh, you're the guy that cleaned it up? And he said, you know, effectively good job, but there was lots of other colorful things that he said that I can't say now. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and looking back on his life, I, I would like to just say this. There are five two players in sports. They have everything you want, speed, power, et cetera. And I think what Red was was a five two player of Texas legend. Because if you look at what he did with the automotive industry, you know, Mike Sullivan, who was tax assessor, you, you know, almost a decade after me, there's a lot of that uh, innovation still there. What he did in sports is legendary. What he did in advertising is legendary. You know, what he did with radio and TV, Mr. President, you know, is legendary. And what he's done with philanthropy and charity that you all are now all still doing is still legendary. So thank you, Matt, uh, uh, Senator Campbell, for bringing a resolution about what is a five-tool legendary Texan, Red McCombs. Thank you, Senator. Senator, Senator Menendez, I'm going to close with you, okay? Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not going to say that I knew Red. I knew him from afar. But between him and Lowry Mays, specifically in the entertainment industry, as it relates to minority businesses, as it relates to African-American businesses, you may or may not be aware that part of that radio uh, conglomerate, he sold off to Kathy Hughes. Kathy Hughes is an African-American female who was a disc jockey in Washington, D.C. And as a result of the sale and, to, and the mentoring, mentoring that was provided by Lowry and I guess ostensibly by Red also, uh, that company has become the largest African-American radio company in the entire United States of America. So not only did he walk the walk, he talked to talk, but he walked with everyone. Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I also rise to thank my colleagues, Senator Campbell, 
and I'm honored to join her as a co-author of the Senate Resolution 618. Marsha, it was good to talk to you before. You know, folks, we heard a lot about Red McCombs. He is a larger-than-life Texan, a real visionary. We talked about that earlier. But, you know, to me, what I like to know about people is sort of a little bit about their origin. Where do they come from? What made them that way? And one of the quotes that Red is attributed to Red that I enjoy the most is about his parents. Father was a mechanic who earned $25 a week, but yet he tithed every week. And then he said that he saw them share with those who had less and noticed the joy of giving and how it never ceased to amaze him. And I think that never left Red. And Red was obviously blessed with his vision, whether it was the Spurs or the Minnesota Vikings or whether it was growing a small business coming from Corpus Christi, moving to San Antonio and building Red McCombs Automotive. The investment with Clear Channel that really took off. But it was after that. It's when he visited M.D. Anderson when he had a friend who was dying. And he was struck by the kindness of every employee he came across. And it struck him to the point that he decided he wanted to give back to the institution. Joined the board, made a very large contribution. And that sort of thing continued. He was on uh, numerous boards. But every single board, every CEO would tell you that he was always trying to help make things better, make life better. Many of us who uh, served in San Antonio for a long time had the privilege of getting to know him. And, and I was telling Shirley, one of the things that I enjoyed the most about Red is Red was always looking for people to get the job done. Didn't care, didn't worry about the minutia, what your, you know, where you lined up, where you came, he said, if you're ready to get the job done. And that vision, that interest in seeing who the person was that would help get the job done, help lead to people like when he was struck by the sadness and the story of a young man who lost his father at a young age, and Red took an interest in this young man. He was in high school, gave him a job, worked and the automotive, I think, at the very bottom, washing cars, bringing the cars around, doing everything. Baseball player, I think, helped. You know, UT got an interest and went off to UT, got his education. And today, that young man, whose mom was a teacher, who probably would have, who knows where he would have been after the loss of his dad, to that young man is a UT regent, a successful man that we know as Rad Weaver. Red always invested in the future by investing in people, by investing in things that would make us better. So yeah, made a lot of money, was a visionary, had, you know, he, had, he was a showman, he, he, had, he had great vision, but more than anything, he had a good heart. And that's the most important part to me. And Marsha, I, mean, I know you miss him every day, and your family, your daughter, and your grandson, but uh, as a state, we miss his vision and his willingness to work with whoever wanted to get the job done. It's an honor to just stop for a sec, just to remember someone who didn't see barriers. He just saw goals and saw how we could make Texas better for more people. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Campbell. Thank you. Um, the members, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to add my own comments. You know, you talked about where did they come from, Senator Menendez. I always look at people and, and uh, see how their children turned out. And uh, I know Marsha the best of the family members, and she is such a gracious lady, continues that spirit of giving to all the nonprofits and the hospitals and the charities. And for a family that had so much wealth through hard work, 
the values that, that he learned from his dad, uh, he passed on down and they're passing down to the grandchildren. You know, the movie Giant, I have the poster. Uh, uh, that was a movie I watched as a kid before I moved to Texas. And when you tell that story, Senator Nichols, he was kind of, kind of symbolic of, of the greatness of Texas because those are true Texas stories. Uh, it's not what you earn, it's not what you make, it's what you give back. And he truly gave back. For me, and some of you won't be happy with this comment about Red when I tell you, I would not be Lieutenant Governor today except for Red McCombs. Because I was a small radio station owner in Houston in the 90s, and they were growing their company, Lowry, Mays, and Red. Didn't know them. <clears throat> and they purchased my uh, radio stations. And so I joined the company <clears throat> as a uh, vice president in 1990. Five, I think it was, and for five years, although I didn't have close contact with him, more with Lowry, uh, I would go to the general manager's meetings and I'd hear him speak and I'd meet him. Uh, but that financial uh, success for us uh, through that radio station that his purchase and becoming a member of the Clear Channel family really allowed me to have the financial resources to run for office in the Texas Senate uh, less than a decade later. So had that not happened, and by the way, when it happened, we were the, I think the 35th and 36th radio stations that he and Lowry bought. They had started with one. Uh, and the reason he got in the radio business, he, he spent all this money in car commercials on radio stations. And he said, if I'm spending all this money with these radio stations, why don't I just own them? And that's how he thought. And so uh, when he purchased us, 35th and 36th radio station, I think that was the number, in five years, they were over 1,200 and became the biggest radio operator in the country. Um, so I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Red McCombs and Lowry Mays. And the first time I really sat down with Red when I was running for office, I told him that story. He didn't really connect the dots at that point. You know, I was a general manager of one of many radio stations that he might see once a year. He didn't really connect those dots. And I told him, Red, uh, good or bad, I'm here because of you and Lowry Mays. So changed my life. And like I said, that may be one thing, Marsha, that they're saying, gosh, Red did that, help Dan become lieutenant governor? We could have had a better choice. But uh, what a great Texan, what a great family. You're an incredible person, yourself, the whole family. And I know Rad would be here, he's out of the country. Another great story. So, uh, a legend, there won't be another Red McCombs. Just won't be. Um, members, please rise in adoption of this resolution. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. For the friends um, of Red McCombs and the family, there is a reception at the Lieutenant Governor's dining room. Senators, please feel, please join us if you can. And all the senators signed the resolution. I want you to know that. Red McCombs did em embody the spirit of the Lone Star State through his love of thinking big and his zest for deal-making and adventure. He leaves behind an inspiring legacy for all Texans. And with that, Mr. President, I move adoption. Uh, members, and before adoption, and, and forgive us if we don't come back for a long time, we have a lot to do on our very last day. Um, uh, members, uh, it's a great honor to honor Red McCombs. The resolution is adopted, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, thank you, members.
Members, please take your seats. Members in the lounge, uh, please come out on the floor. We have a memorial resolution. All staff needs to be seated. Any conversations need to be outside the chamber. Sergeant of Arms, I would ask you for strict enforcement during this period of time, and I would ask you to keep everyone out so that we're not interrupted during this resolution. Thank you. Chair lays out the fol following resolutions. Chair, Secretary will read, read them. Senate Resolutions 576 through 596 by Gutierrez in memory of our precious victims in Uvalde. Chair, recognize Senator Gutierrez. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We're going to, um, I appreciate you letting us do this and giving us this opportunity to do it. So, and also thank you for allowing us to distribute. Uh, these magazines that were issued by the local newspaper this past Sunday. Thank you for letting us do that. Um, this will be a little bit different than we normally do our resolutions, uh, Mr. President and members, and our memorials. Uh, I've asked uh, my colleagues, both sides of the aisle, to be able to introduce a little brief story, Mr. President, about each child. And um, I know all of you wanted to contribute, and there was, just wasn't enough. There was 21 uh, folks. Um, and so with that, Mr. President, I just want to begin by discussing Senate Resolution 593. There is an order that we have, and each member knows the order. I'll do the first two and the last two, Mr. President, and then we'll close. So thank you for your um, latitude today. Um, members, as you all know, uh, last year on this day, um, a tragedy occurred in Uvalde, Texas, the likes of which we haven't seen in many, many years. And um, it was a very sad day for all of us. A sad day for a town about 70 minutes from my home. Um, a town that I'd gone through many times campaigning, knew several people in that town. And, um, but since then, I have, I, I, I had never spent so much time in Uvalde as I have had in this last year. And so today we rise to honor the people we lost that day, and we ask God to protect them. And um, with that, I want to begin with telling you a little bit about Tess Mata, if I may, Mr. President, and Senate Resolution 593. You can follow along, members, in your magazines. Um, it's not too much of a distraction to you. Most of them are in order, except for the two in the, that I've taken out of, out of context here in the last two. I've gotten to know Tess's parents very well. They're friends of mine, Ronnie and Jerry Mata. Their daughter, Faith, who just graduated from Southwest Texas, or Texas State, I'm sorry, Texas State College. And they're just wonderful people. Tess was a beautiful little girl. She was an athlete. She played softball and soccer. She competed in gymnastics. She was an avid fan of the Houston Astros, Senator Alvarado. She loved Jose Altuve. He played second base just like Jose. And she was on her softball team, as I suggested, at second base. She was very feisty and outspoken. She was, had a, she was very blessed and caring. And I was in Washington, D.C. with her parents one day when they told me that she was also had a very quiet side to her because she had to deal with certain health care issues, certain seizures that she had 
in her life. And so the family, in her honor, established a scholarship program at Texas State. You can all read about that. And if any of you want to contribute, that'll help incoming freshmen that are interested in, in the medical field. Um, we want to pray for Tess, for sure. She will uh, forever be remembered uh, by many, by all of us. I know. I know that. Um, Mr. President, I'll just continue to go, and then the other members will follow, as I said. So I hope that that's not too much of a out of order. Senator, uh, Senate Resolution 596. There's a little boy named Uzziah Cross Garcia. Uzziah is a wonderful little boy. He was raised over the last three and a half years of his life by his guardians, his aunt, Nikki Cross, and Brett Cross. Some of you have probably seen Brett and Nikki on television. They're very outspoken, and they certainly want to see um, some change for, their, for the future of Texas. This little boy was a shining star. And when he moved in with his guardians, his aunt and his uncle, that little boy just turned on like a light. Uh, he was incredibly outgoing and sweet and deeply affectionate young boy. He treasured his family and he enjoyed spending time with his siblings and, and his step siblings too. His, um, Brett's and Nikki's oldest son is a ball player and he kind of modeled after him. He was a very competitive of na nature. Um, Uzziah, or Uzi, as he was called, loved Spider-Man. That was, that, was, that was his hero, Spider-Man. And so when you see Spider-Man, think of, think of Uzziah. He wanted to be a police officer when he grew up because he wanted to help people. Um, he wanted to help those that couldn't help themselves. And so he is also one of our heroes that we're honoring today. Um, we will pray, hold him up in prayer in a moment here at the end. And with that, Mr. President, I'll yield to uh, Senator, Senator Alvarado. Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Gutierrez, thank you for allowing us to remember and reflect with you um, we, we applaud you. You have been on the ground since day one. You've never left the families. You've been our constant reminder of that day and the families that are still suffering. I had a chance to, to go there with you and to the school and meet some of the community and attend a funeral of two individuals. A young lady I want to talk about today, this is... SR 591, Nevaya Alyssa Bravo. Alyssa was 10 years old when her life was taken too soon. Parents are Maria Magdalene Garcia and Juan Julian Bravo. She enjoyed the companionship of her two brothers, Juan and Xavier, and her sister, Monique. She was also cherished by her grandparents and her many aunts and uncles. She was a caring and devoted daughter who always helped out her parents when needed. Some of the things she loved to do was softball, play softball and draw and paint. She was very active. She loved being outdoors, especially at her father's ranch, riding horses, feeding the animals. Her joyful spirit was contagious and is deeply missed by her parents. There's a mural that was painted. It's in this magazine here. And the artists, they incorporated some of her drawings and paintings here. They provided images which included a heart, two birds, a rose, with a handwritten note that reads, I love you. Maggie Garcia 
here in this book. She, um, she says that Nevaeh's name is heaven, spelled backwards. The heaven she went too soon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Gutierrez. Senator Blanco, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Gutierrez, for bringing this important resolution. Um, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, Jose Manuel Flores. Um, you know, Jose was remembered uh, for his warm and compassionate nature. Uh, who touched the hearts of uh, everyone that he encountered. Jose was an honorable student, and he not only excelled academically, but embraced the joy of life through his love for playing baseball. He liked to go fishing, and he liked playing video games. Uh, he was driven by his sincere desire to uh, selflessly serve. And Jose, and I believe his family called him Josecito, uh, dreamed of being a police officer. Uh, he wanted to make a positive difference in the lives of those uh, around him. May the eternal light and spirit of Jose inspire us all. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Eckhart. Eliana Garcia's page is on page 12, if y'all would like to take a look at her mural. Eliana Garcia, known to her family and friends as Ellie, was born June 4th, 2012. Just shy of her 10th birthday, uh, she was murdered alongside her classmates and her teacher. Ellie was the second oldest of five girls, often helping take care of her younger sisters, Adriana, Viviana, Adeline, and alongside her big sister, Janelle, and with her parents, Jennifer and Stephen. Ellie loved Jesus, praying out loud every night with her mom, Jennifer. And you'll see on her page that in a TikTok that she made, she said, Jesus, he died for us, so when we die, we'll be up there for him. Her favorite movie was Encanto. She loved cumbia music, and she wanted to grow up to be a teacher. She spent weekends with her grandparents, Rogelio and Nelda, reminding them to take their medication, <laughs> helping to mow the lawn, and making tostadas and chalupas in the kitchen. Ellie had a joyful spirit. She loved doing TikTok dances in preparation for her quinceanera one day, where she planned to wear a showstopper dress in her favorite color, purple. Instead of a purple quince, a purple mural now sits at 117 Northwest Street in Uvalde in remembrance of Ellie. The mural is adorned with her favorite things, flowers and butterflies, cheer and basketball, Takis chips and Tapatio hot sauce, and a cross for her ever important faith. It is a beautiful mural, but it cannot bring back the smell of her hair or the sound of her voice. As Minister Peterson said this morning to us all, we are here to protect the families and children of Texas. Ellie deserved to be protected. We don't have the power to bring her back, to bring back the smell of her hair or the sound of her voice, but we do have power. Ellie loved Jesus. Imagine her voice praying out loud every night for us to do something, and to do it for the next Ellie.
Thank you, Senator. Senator Hinojosa. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members, and thank you, Senator Gutierrez, uh, for this very special memorial resolution. Uh, and I memorialize uh, Irma Garcia uh, and her husband, Joe Garcia. Uh, Irma Garcia was one of the teachers who was murdered uh, in the mass shooting that took place in Uvalde. Joe Garcia was her husband, uh, and they were childhood sweethearts. They met in high school, uh, and their love for each other grew and grew and bonded, and they were married 25 years. Uh, and they had four children, uh, and she went into teaching. She loved teaching, loved her students, treated the students like her own children. Her husband worked at HEB. Uh, he was a produce packer, but he worked his way to become a manager. This is an all-American family, and Irma Garcia loved her students, that she always said that she loved when they would watch and walk on graduation day with a cap and gown. They would give her a satisfaction of knowing that all the work, all the sacrifice, all the grades, and the paperwork she had to do late at night in grading the students and mentoring them paid off. It was worth it to her. Uh, and her husband, Joe, was a very loving father, a family man, hard worker at HEB, uh, and they were married for 25 years, and unfortunately, both of them died days apart. Ima Garcia, the teacher, uh, was in the classroom when the shooter broke in, and she died protecting her children, covering them, protecting them from danger. And her last breath, her commitment to her children, her students. Her husband, Joe Garcia, was shocked, heartbroken, and in grief, to the point that when he went to lay the flowers on her cross memorial two days after, this tragic incident, this tragic disaster, this tragic mass shooting, he went home and died. He had a heart attack and couldn't stand the grief and died as a heartbroken man. It's a very sad situation, very sad tragedy. They left uh, four children, four loving children, some young adults, uh, and I'll read their names. I think it's important to know who those children were because one was named Kristen Garcia, is named Kristen Garcia, a member of the United States Marine Corps. Jose, 19, is a Texas State University student. Daughter Liliana, 15, a high school sophomore. And Andrea, a Sandra, 12, a seventh grader. This is a family who are left without a father and mother, losing both parents uh, in this tragic situation. For me, when I think of Irma Garcia, uh, I think of my teachers. She was a fourth grade teacher. Uh, and I empathize with someone that was so committed to her students, who mentored them and cried with them, took care of their problems and issues, dealt with their parents, educating them to become young adults, uh, and yet she faced such a short life. On a normal, regular day, we think, well, that's not gonna happen here. It won't happen in our community, but it does. And unfortunately, probably will again. Uh, and for me, uh, I am just heartbroken myself when I started reading the background and the family and how Irma Garcia died, protected her children, her students, as a mother, and her husband, Joe Garcia, who was 50 years old, 
dying of grief, losing the love of his life, his wife, uh, and uh, they will forever live in the minds and hearts of the people of Uvalde and those of us who got to know him. And I wish that both of them may rest in peace and be in heaven. And the family find peace in their hearts, their friends, their daughters and sons. And find peace in their heart. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Hancock. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Gutierrez, uh, we thank you. These are times that you want to get to know these individuals that we're speaking of, but it hurts to get too close. So I have the privilege of recognizing and honoring Amory Jo Garza, 10 year old little girl, beautiful, smart. My word says sassy here, but I believe her mom's description was a funny little diva, which we all probably know some 10 year old girls that fit that description. She was a defender of those that needed defending, and she proved that that day in a part that I will share later. Um, she was very creative, loved the arts. Her desire was to be an art teacher. Who knows what she would have been? She often carried around a ball of clay, making things with it. She um, was very creative in all that she did. Loved others, loved her family. In fact, she was honored by the Girl Scouts of the United States with the bronze uh, award uh, because of her bravery during this situation. She was like many of us. She loved Starbucks. She loved Chick-fil-A. Common little girl until that day. Those, that day began and the classroom was entered. In her bravery, in order to protect herself and those that were around her, she used her phone and she dialed 911. The wisdom of a 10-year-old to know, to call, and ask for help. Therefore, she was recognized with that uh, recognition for valor, outstanding valor, where a Girl Scout actually gives her life for the lives of others, rarely given out. It is an honor to recognize her today. As I said, I wanted to get to know her. At a point, you have to stop. But I do thank you for the honor to stop and do this and provide the recognition each one of these deserves. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Huffman. I'd like to start by thanking Senator Gutierrez for keeping these murdered children alive for us. And when I say alive, I mean their spirit, we are doing important things here today, members. We all have bills on our desk. We're passing important pieces of legislation, but nothing, nothing we do is as important, in my opinion, as stopping today to remember these murdered children. I have the honor and the privilege to talk today about Xavier James Lopez. Xavier was 11 years old. He was a very active young boy. He played baseball for the Blue Jays. At school, he was on the AB honor roll. His favorite subject was art. At home, he loved to dance. He loved his family. He loved to spend time with his family. His mother said he was hilarious. He was a funny child with a smile that could brighten anyone's day. He loved his classmate, Annabelle Rodriguez, and the two told each other, I love you, every day. In fact, their murals are side by side at the St. Henry de Osso Family Project building. Xavier was a gift to his family. We all have children. They are such blessings. He was deeply loved by his family. His mom said he was a wild child. He could dance the night away. As I stand here today, I like to think maybe he's dancing in heaven. And we can sit here today 
and let's think about these children. Let's think about the horror that they went to as, as they were murdered in that school that day. And let's try to work together to do everything we can to prevent these tragedies in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Johnson. In addition to thanking, I want to acknowledge Senator Gutierrez. Uh, as emotional as this event is and how hard it is when uh, we think about our own kids um, in these conditions, it's unthinkable and it's heavy. And just for a moment here on the Senate floor, it weighs heavily on each of us. And I know that for Senator Gutierrez, he's been carrying it for a long time. And I know it's hard. And I will join my colleagues in thanking him for giving me the honor of um, memorializing one of these kids who died that day. His name was Jace Carmelo Luevanos. He was an energetic kid, and he loved dinosaurs and ninjas frequently together. In fact, some of his dinosaurs were ninjas, and he enjoyed having his friends in the backyard where they could play dinosaurs and ninjas. He was also very close to his parents, a 10-year-old boy who wrote letters to his parents, even though he lived with them, and he always signed them, I love you. And he loved to make coffee for them in the morning, he was close to his siblings. In fact, when the artist who was doing the mural was doing the mural, the siblings wanted to participate, and he, of course, was delighted. So his siblings actually took part in, in painting the mural of young Jace uh, that we will all have, that particularly his community will have and his family will have to remember him. Uh, his parents, his three siblings, and his grandparents will always be close to him in, in their memories, and they'll always love him, and they will always have a hole in their hearts. Thank you, Senator Gutierrez. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Colcourse. Senate Resolution 587. Senator Gutierrez, thank you for this day where we pause and remember the tragedy and the evil acts of one year ago today. Thank you for your tireless efforts and being voices for these families and for these children that they never be forgotten. The community of Uvalde. We hear you and we remember and we grieve with you. I have the honor of remembering Miranda Gale Mathis, reading about her, seeing this precious mural. She would have celebrated her 12th birthday this May, but she died at the age of 11, shy and sweet, Miranda enjoyed spending time outdoors where her pursuits included collecting rocks, shells, and feathers. Little things that we take for granted every day don't even notice. She marveled in them. She was described as having a kind heart, an engaging smile, and a vivid imagination. And she often expressed her love for unicorns and mermaids, particularly those that were her favorite colors of purple and pink. A vivid imagination, a little girl. Those that knew her said she had a loving heart. She was sweet, smart, and a shy tomboy. Uvalde Consolidated ISD now offers a scholarship in her name, the Miranda Mathis Memorial Scholarship. I pray that those that benefit from that scholarship will pause and always remember her. To Deanna, her mother, and Brian, and her brother, her little brother, Bruce, we pray for you. We pray for 
your broken hearts. And we know that Miranda is now in heaven having fun with imagination, with unicorns and mermaids and all the beautiful things that she had in her imagination. Again, Senator, thank you for this day that we pause and remember. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lamentia. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. This is Senate Resolution 578 for Eva Mireles. In the realm of education and adventure, Mrs. Eva Mireles was a shining star. She held certification in bilingual education and special education, and she fearlessly embarked on a journey of over 17 years nurturing the minds and souls of her students. As a fourth grade teacher, she poured boundless love into her craft, ensuring the happiness and well-being of those entrusted to her care, and she always was there advocating for them and making sure that they had everything they needed and were taken care of, up until her last day where she was a selfless hero and died protecting those kids. She was also a loving wife and an amazing mother to Adeline and her dogs. And she was an avid outdoors woman and loved CrossFit and was a legendary karaoke singer. Today, we celebrate her memory, which was forever inspired by her adventurous spirits, her enduring impact, and her selfless heroism. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Gutierrez. You, um, been dealing with a lot. We were just talking about uh, this day a year ago, where you were, what transpired. Um, Senate Resolution 595. It's an honor and a privilege to speak about an inspiring 10-year-old little girl who was murdered, her life cut down much too early. Othea Haven Ramirez, born April 28th, 2012. I wish we could have all met her. She was described as a kind, intelligent, reliable, always eager to help. And Othea, I feel she would be the type of friend to all that we would want in our lives. She was more than just the special, beloved daughter of Ryan Ramirez and Jessica Hernandez, more than just the awesome older sister to Jonah and Akila. She was even more than an aspiring artist. And she certainly was more than another innocent victim to another senseless act of violence. All 21 of them were. When I learned of uh, her story, I saw that how much, so much to love about Althea. And like any great artist's story, it begins, she could be found spending hours drawing in her room picture after picture. She liked to look at YouTube videos on how to capture and create her little favorite characters. Sadly, she can't be here to see it, but maybe you have seen her art grace the front page of Google. I even hear the president has asked for some of her artwork as well. I also saw that she was a leader and a healer for people around her. And it went beyond just her willingness to help. She, she had a best friend who had passed away just a year prior, Nico. I think some of us, if we'd lost our best friend at, you know, age nine or 10, it would have been very difficult to deal with. But Nico's parents said that uh, Althea was so amazing, so special, that in the face of the loss of her best friend, she told Nico's parents that she wanted to stay in touch with them. And she made a painting for them, and she would put a smile on their face. 
They spoke of how amazed they were by her maturity and how healing it was to have someone so young and pure of heart to worry and think about them. Today, we stand here with so many families who face this unimaginable loss. I wish Althea could be here to help us the way she helped Nico's parents. He and all these other children had so much more to offer this world. We owe them, we owe them a lot. We owe them this and so much more. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Gutierrez. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Paxton. Senator Paxton. We will come back. Senator Gutierrez will come back to Senator Paxton, or, or you can do that one at the end. Senator Perry. SR 583, Leia, Leila Marie Salazar. If you look on page 41, she's described as a music-loving athlete. Layla was a high-spirited young girl who took advantage of any opportunity to sing and dance, though very energetic, sometimes rambunctious. But she was always respectful of her elders. And she was always the first one to greet relatives, friends, and guests who visited the family home. Her comparative nature shined in many different activities, such as swimming and running. She loved Dallas Cowboys. She loves Guns and Roses, sweet child of mine. Her mural has her running hurdles there, uh, and she was a pretty good athlete. She was the, she said they, she took everyone by storm because she was so small, yet the fastest kid in the campus. She was born in Chicago, but clearly looking through the stories and the words in the family unit there, she was all Texan. You can look at the face of some of the pictures she's in, and you can kind of see a little honoriness just a little mischievous. You can tell this one was going to lead and be a leader. Members, I am reminded on this side of heaven that waits us all, I hope, that we're all prepared for that. That a broken heart means we have loved something. It means you've lived. This country, this world, this state, this community, this family, this body are all broken hearted because we have got the opportunity to love our family, our members, this group of kids, this community. And I think it's that that we should focus on is we are broken hearted about something we had the privilege either indirectly or directly to have loved. We live in a fallen world and these days, unfortunately, will haunt us and continue to happen. It is foretold. We need God back in everything more than we've ever had it. It's not going to heal the hurt that we want to go away by having that relationship and knowing Him today. But that's all that can help my fellow senator across the way there. I worry about our fellow senator over there. I pray for him every day that he's going to find a peace that nobody in this room can understand or, 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 or even realize the depths of the hurt that he has been a party to or so. But here's what I do know. Our children kind of get an automatic path. They were taken way too long in a fallen world for things that we try to legislate around all day long and we do a lot of good things to try to prevent and try to circumvent and try to reinforce what we believe is right in a country. But we're never going to be successful at every level. But those kids were taken that day. And he says, let them come to me. 
And I know the fact that the hurt on this side is something that we as a culture are responsible for. But I also know he must have needed a lot of help up there to have 21 souls join him that day. And all I can do is rest assured that they're in a whole lot better place, a better homecoming for us all. But it also reminds me that when I go home on weekends, or even when I leave the Senate floor and we're going to hug each other in a week or so and say, looking forward to it, we need to embrace that moment just a little bit tighter with a large, sincere heart that we mean it. And I do mean it. I'm a hugger. It's kind of, kind of not my nature if people would view me from an outside, but you got to go home. And when you hear those, see those family kids or when that, you know, when Pops needs to stop what he's doing and go play in the sand, he needs to stop what he's doing and go play in the sand. Nothing's more important than playing in the sand at that minute. So I hope this is a time to reflect on where our priorities, our values. It's about the people. It's about the humanity. And it's about God, the ones God has put in our circle of influence. This is a reminder, we are not guaranteed the next moment. And that we should embrace every moment for what it was intended to do, and that's bring joy to our lives. Nothing can be said that can make this feel right on this side. But I have the faith to know that they're in a better spot today. Thank you, Senator Gutierrez, for keeping this at the forefront of the conversation. Thank you, Senator Perry. Senator Springer. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, Senator Gutierrez. Um, it is so meaningful to hear everybody in your comments because you're bringing more than just a name, more than just the number 21. We're bringing these kids to life one more time to remember who they truly were. And I've got the honor today to uh, talk about McKenna Elrod uh, Seiler. She was just 10 years old. She radiated love, kindness towards everybody. She was a natural leader who readily endeared herself to others, making new friends everywhere she went. She had a sunny smile and it brightened the entire world. She had a love for animals that led her to join 4-H club. And she also enjoyed participating in softball and gymnastics, dancing and singing, going to school, and spending time with her family. You'll see on page 42 in her mural, she has her dog Bailey, her horse, little babe chick, because she just loved animals so much. She never hesitated to help out when asked, and she had a habit of writing notes and leaving them in hidden places for her family members to find. McKenna's father said that she had just started reading the Bible and that her favorite song was Lion and the Lamb by Leland. I learned that purple was her favorite color. And so today, you will realize I'm, for the first time, not wearing a green tie. And I wore a purple tie in her honor. And to McKenna's family, I am so sorry for your loss. No words can fully express the magnitude and the grief and the heartbreak you're going through. And to McKenna's sister, she was right when she said our lives will never be the same way after this day. And her mother, April, said, you're exactly right. It reminds me of the tragedy that some of us have felt when tragedy has taken a loved one away and it literally changes from that day and it's a marker in time that becomes before and after. And so Senator Gutierrez I appreciate again you involving me in this and having this day here. Thank you. Thank, thank you Senator. Senator West. You know, members, 
Senator Gutierrez, thank you for making certain that we remember this day. One of the hardest things that I've had to do as a state senator. We're talking about babies. Babies. We're talking about the impact murders incident has had on families and the community, our state and our country. Harking back to the words of the Declaration of Independence, all these truths to be self-evident, all men, all persons are created equal. They're endowed with certain unalienable rights. Life, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, life. In the spring, I, I feel it. Gutierrez, I understand how you feel. All of us do. Members, I know that most of us want to do something about this. Some instances we look at our Constitution and the Second Amendment and say, you know, that that trumps everything else. Trump, what's been guaranteed by our Declaration of Independence, life. I know that most of you have the political will to get this done, but again, fear the political repercussions in this, in this chamber. We should not allow Jayla Gordo to have died in vain. Those of us that have some consternation about what should be done, Take your telephone out, look at the pictures of sons and daughters. Think about what Senator Perry said a few moments ago and everyone else in terms of these young lives taken. Can you imagine your child, your grandchildren, school and all of a sudden this occurred how you would have felt that day, how you would feel today. We have a right as a political body to have differences. Some point, some time, some point in time, we shouldn't become jaded. Say, oh well, here's another mass shooting, loss of our children. Jayla's family. Jayla, a bright 10-year-old, energetic, loved playing basketball, being outdoors. Question is whether she was more like her father or like her mother. Fact is, is that she had a little bit of both in them. It's on page 45. I would hope that as we this memorial, but some of you who have the political consternation of allowing the status quo to prevail would rethink. I respect your right to have whatever opinion you have. Think about it. If Jayla had been your daughter, your granddaughter, you want inaction status quo of the day. So on behalf of Jayla's family, her mother, her father, her family, her brothers and sisters. I ask us to remember her as we remember the other 20 young souls lost. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Senator Whitmire. Thank you, sir. Senator Gutierrez, thank you for slowing us down today to allow us to put face and a name, personality with these young victims and their teachers. 
And I want you to know, Senator Gutierrez, that your colleagues appreciate your fight and your courage on behalf of your constituents. I know what's going through the mind of your colleagues because I'm experiencing now, I'm thinking of my two daughters. I did research and became familiar with Liana Torres. I could place my daughter, Whitney or Sarah, with her activities. Of course, I immediately started feeling the pain of Liana's family and her friends' families. Because Liana was a vibrant girl with a smile that could light up a room. She enjoyed being silly and was always making others laugh, nurturing and always putting others before herself. She was also a very good softball player on track to make her city's all-star team. She loved everything about the game. Whether she was pitching, catching, or in the outfield, it really did not matter to her that she would spend hours practicing her fast pitch with her grandfather in a makeshift bullpen he made from store-bought netting in the front yard. She was blessed with the companionship of her parents, brothers, sisters, and an extended family that included her grandparents, her many aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews. Let me finish by assuring the Torres family and the other families that these victims will not be forgotten. I think we will all remember this special day. And I hope that it will become the memorial that we go forward and recognize on this terrible day. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Whitmire. Senator Zaffarini. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gutierrez, for your leadership, your courage, and your passion in addressing not only the lives and memories and honors bestowed on these children, but also on the importance of all the issues that are related to that tragic day. Rogelio Fernandez Torres is honored on page 49 of the Uvalde magazine and in Senate Resolution 585. Uvalde Consolidated ISD also honors him with a scholarship. He was the son of Evadulia Horta and Federico Torres, Jr. Members, his father waited at the scene for hours and had to provide DNA to confirm his son was one of the students killed. An outgoing and kind-hearted boy, the 10-year-old was always smiling and eager to help others. In fact, his Aunt Precious described him as the life of the party. He enjoyed being outdoors and pursued a number of hobbies. Among his favorites were playing football, Pokemon, and video games, all of which are illustrated on his mural. May his memory live forever, and may he rest in peace. May God bless his parents and all the families and communities and persons who have been impacted by this horrific tragedy. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Zafferini. Senator Paxton. Thank you, Mr. President. I remember this day. I remember sitting in an interim hearing and Senator Menendez asked us to pause. That something terrible had happened. Throughout the course of the hearing, the numbers kept rising. Thank you, Senator Gutierrez. I'm honored to recognize and remember Maddie Rodriguez with Senate Resolution 586. I have a daughter named Maddie. Maddie was born on November 17, 2011. Her favorite color was green. I 
and she loved her lime green commerce tennis shoes and jalapenos. Her favorite meal was Whataburger meal number 13. And she enjoyed the mango dragon fruit drink from Starbucks. She was a great student. She was on the A and B honor roll. And her hobbies included photography, sewing, and painting. She wanted to become a marine biologist. Something that captured her imagination and her heart in kindergarten. And she was headed to Texas A&M University in Corpus. She loved animals, and she loved babies. Her family said that Maddie was kind and ambitious, friendly, and had a sweet soul. And I would simply say that she still does. And she will live on in our hearts. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Paxton. Uh, Senator Gutierrez, there are three names remaining. Um, yes, uh, Mr. President, thank you. Um, members, I'll direct your attention to Senate Resolution 582 for Annabel Gabriel Guadalupe Rodriguez. Um, Annabel was born on November 29th in 2011 to Monica Gallegos and Jesse Rodriguez. She enjoyed the color blue and she loved butterflies. And you can see that on her mural there on page 34. She enjoyed watching TikTok and spending time with her sisters and family. She uh, was often on the honor roll. She really excelled in school and really enjoyed it very much. She had a friend who I know his parents very well, Felicia and Abel Lopez. Um, Senator Huffman talked about Xavier earlier. Well, I don't know if they were sweethearts or not, but they told each other, I love you every day. So that sounds like a sweetheart to me. We all had a fourth grade sweetheart, I imagine. Their murals are side by side each other at the family project building that was mentioned earlier. She loved animals and she loved to rescue the strays. She is survived by her parents and two sisters, Anastasia Gallegos and her twin, Angeli Rodriguez. And so um, we pray for Annabelle as well. And the last two members, Senate Resolution 588, we honor Jacqueline Jalen Casares. Jackie, as is, is a lot of us know her. Jackie is on page eight and nine. Jackie's parents were the first people I met um, in Uvalde of the parents. And it's hard to be able to the strangest thing, I was just trying to figure out how all this happened, you know, because it's, it's hard to figure out how you go up to someone and say, hey, I'm, I'm your senator, I, it's going to be okay. You know it's not. You know it's not. And there's a lot of distrust and there's a lot of what are you doing here kind of stuff. And you're just trying to be there for people to make sure that your constituents' needs are met, the government's doing what it's supposed to do and so on. I met her father, Javier, and he said, look, just give us some time, give us some space. I said, okay, absolutely. And then they invited me to their rosary. I got to meet them, and I got to meet their daughter, her older sister, Jasmine, her brother, Jonathan, who's in the Marines. And they're just the most wonderful people that have taken me into their lives and have allowed me to be just an omniscient observer at times because you watch them on Facebook and you see the videos 
of these children, all of them really, the ones we've mentioned, the ones you've mentioned, I see them all on Facebook when they're alive. I've seen all the other stuff, but we talked about that the other night. We're not gonna we're not gonna do that today. And Jackie was warm, she was affectionate, she loved everybody, she loved singing. She loved recording her videos and keeping in touch with her friends on social media, just like all our kids and grandkids, right? And she adored animals. Um, my favorite video of her is her, she's laid out on the ground, and her two, two of her dogs are just licking on her and jumping on her, and she's just laughing and laughing and laughing. She's just joyous. So I don't ever forget that video. I go back to it often on her mother's Facebook, on Gloria's Facebook. She had a dream to be a veterinarian. She loved animals so much. Her favorite color was sage. And there was one thing that she always wanted to do, and that was go to Paris. You see that on her mural. All the parents that you've talked about, they're the hardest people, hardest working people you've ever met. Just hard working, some working in ag, some just hard working labor jobs, office jobs, you name it. Um, some of them never left you out, they believe it or not, very far. I'm so happy that Javier, her dad, and and her mother, Gloria, and Jasmine are going to be going to Paris next week to honor Jackie's memory because that was her dream, to go to Paris and paint. Loved to paint rocks, and her dad has painted so much rocks, and her dad is so talented. And they're going to take a few rocks, and they're going to put them by the Eiffel Tower. And so we want to certainly keep her in prayer today. Then at Resolution 584 is Alexandria Lexi Anaya Rubio. And Lexi is towards the back of your, of your book as well. Figure out what page she's on. She's on page 38 and 39. And you'll see her beautiful mural. And Lexi sure did love butterflies, just like my girls love butterflies. And I think that that's what made all of this so hard for me. I spent the first 16 days out there, and every day school was still going on for my kids, and I'd kiss them and hug them when they were in bed getting ready to leave for school, and I'd take off to Uvalde. And then just getting to know these parents. I mean, I think all of that just kind of brings you in this space. And sadly and horribly, the just this... 77 minute failure that we're not going to get into today either had me stuck there and had me stuck at looking at things that I probably shouldn't have looked at. I apologize for being a little mental <laughs> from time to time this session. Um, Lexi was this great kid. She loved math, she was an athlete told her mom she was going to go to St. Mary's University where her mom was a hard-working woman, um, Kimberly Rubio, working at the local newspaper that put out these magazines, by the way, this past Sunday. Her father, Felix, a wonderful, quiet man, was a sheriff's deputy. And he always had the day off, but he went in there with about 17 minutes left. And tried to go into that room where his daughter was. And they didn't allow him to do so, of course. And he's forever broken up about that, as we all are and should be. Her Facebook videos are especially wonderful because... You also see, like Jackie and Uzziah and Tess, you see her playing, and her mom put out this one video where her dad's got her in the batting cage. Lois, you always talk about sports. I know you grew up in all that. 
little girl could hit. She could hit. Her dad would pitch to her in the batting cage. And she was just an ace. She relished the experience of winning a championship with her used basketball team last season. She drew inspiration from her mother. Like I said, she wanted to be a mathematician and a lawyer. I want to close with something. I, I hardly read things when I talk about these things. But I wrote something this morning on my way in. Um, because I was trying to put some thoughts together without getting into the politics of what we've dealt with. I think we've done a lot of that this session. I want to be respectful of, of the children and honoring their memories. And it's my hope that we get to some solutions down the road. I want to briefly thank everybody that helped out today on all of you in, that are here in spirit. And I want to thank the people who called me on that day, Jose, Senator Menendez, all of you that reached out. Senator Alvarado, Senator Colcourse, you called me within a, the next day and we talked. And all of you uh, that reached out to me, and I really appreciate that. I was writing this this morning, and I was just, uh, I was just trying to find the reasons why. It's hard to find the reasons why. A year of mental turmoil only leads to more questions. Trying to decipher what's real and what's not real. The craziness of a moment that never seems to stop. You're chasing rabbit holes and fighting windmills. It just becomes an impossible task. And so we pray. We pray for solace to loved ones that never comes. We pray for answers to questions that are in vain. We pray for souls to be seated with our Lord in a better place. I too pray every day. I pray now. I pray for enlightenment. Pray for wisdom. I pray that I try to be kinder to people. I'm sorry to those that I've offended this session. They know who I'm talking about. And sometimes, like last week, I pray to find the words of what to say next. And that God will help me say what I'm trying to say in the right way. I pray for the idea that we all come into this building with only one goal. And that's to make our community a better place. To make it safer for our kids. Give them a chance to live their best lives with hope and beauty and love. I pray that the world we leave them is better than the one we received. I pray that in all our differences, we aspire to our better angels. Perhaps remember those moments when we were little. We played ball with our friends, or played dolls, or toy soldiers, or pet, or with our pets. Or perhaps those moments, and I know you all did it, when you laid down in the cool grass in your backyard and you looked at the sky, that the clouds passed by, when you dreamed of becoming astronauts or superheroes. Or doctors. Or if you were like me and you thought, well, I want to be a trucker. <laughs> or a train conductor so I could see this great land. I ask you to remember those days as you look at the pictures of these children. Remember your better angels. As you forge forward in these remaining days in this building... As you come back into future sessions, what do we want for ourselves and for our children and for our grandchildren? Ask yourselves that. We are broken and we can fix a few things. Lord, I ask you today to guard these children.
For I know that as your own son sits by your side, these precious angels are with, are with you, watching you over us. We ask for your continued guidance and your mercy as we proceed through this journey that we call life. Please keep these families, the families of these angels and their precious guardian teachers, Irma Garcia and Eva Mireles, in your embrace. Give them the solace to know that they are not alone. They will always have family, friends, and a community to be by their side, even in their darkest moments. Yes, this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Mr. President. Move adoption. Senator Gutierrez, uh, this has been well done. Um, your generosity to reach out to other members, to share those stories, this will be a day not one of these senators will forget in their life. This is the finest memorial service recognition, resolution that we've ever had, I think, on this chamber floor in my history of 17 years here. And each one of you spoke so eloquently. Um, I will say to you, Senator, that uh, you gave me a chance to reflect uh, listening to each of these stories because, members, I will tell you, if you ever run for lieutenant governor one day, and I'm sure some of you will, one of the things that comes along with the job are funerals. More than I could have ever imagined. Sutherland Springs, Santa Fe, Walmart in El Paso, Odessa, my backyard neighbor who lost four grandsons and a son by a convict who killed them one day last year, or the 50 plus police officers who have been killed in the line of duty, all of this, and Hurricane Harvey in just eight years. I probably attended 40, 50, I've lost count of memorial services and, and church services. I came to several of the services and sat in the back in, in the Uvalde because that was the way to do it. Um, seldom, if ever, I think I've spoken once. You go to there to respect the families and you get to learn about these families. And I will tell you that as you went through these stories, I reflected on the little children of police officers who had lost their father or the wives, the young wives so often, or the father and mother who lost a son um, of the people in El Paso at the service at the ball field, or, the, or Chris Stone uh, in Santa Fe, who we passed a bill there uh, in honor of those families at Santa Fe who, who was uh, laid out in a Dallas Cowboy um, casket because he loved that team. So. The one thing I've learned through all this is evil is alive. It is a fallen world. And in a country sometimes, in a world where we're trying to kick God out so many times, we always go to our knee and pray during these times. And if we just did it all the time. Um, and I've been amazed by the faith, Senator, in all of these situations where God rises to the top for these families. It's hard in Eliana's case, Senator Eckhart, that you said that she prayed about Jesus. How does this happen? And I remember a man at Sutherland Springs, and I think he lost five or six family members in the church shooting, and he said, we can't question God in these times. We have to trust God. And so it's our faith. And today you've helped all of us reflect on all of these times and uh, you'll never forget these stories and faces. Um, I can't remember all of the 50 or 60, but I remember a lot of them. And uh, at the end of the day, it's our faith in Jesus Christ that you just prayed to. It's the only thing we have for hope. It's the only thing we hold on to. And it's when our faith is tested. So thank you for today. Um, thank you for your words. Thank you for sharing their stories. Uh, they will... Uh, never be forgotten. Uh, members, Senator Betancourt would like to add all names to the resolution. Um, any objection to that motion? Hearing none. And please all rise in honor of these children and teachers. Thank you, members. Uh, members, quite frankly, on a normal day, I would adjourn for the day. Um, but this is the last day, and we have a lot of work to do. So I think it would be uh, appropriate. Let's break until... 2 p.m., 20 minutes. Um, everyone reflect, uh, take your break, 
and we will go strong starting at 2 o'clock. Please be here on time at 2 o'clock so we can begin. If you're not, I'm going to begin without you. So be on here to begin our work. Thank you, members. We will stand at ease until 2 o'clock.
Senate will come to order. Senator Shorten, you're recognized for a motion. It's been the record of business. They can consider committee substitute House Bill 5. Thank you, Mr. President and members. It's my honor today to bring to the floor committee substitute to House Bill 4, which renews and offers a new direction for Texas's economic incentive program, school abatement program. Member Senator Schwartner moves suspension of the regular order of business. Committee substitute House Bill 5. There is objection. Secretary will call. Oh, oh. Senator West, for what purpose? Uh, can we slow down just for one second here? For what purpose? A uh, question of the author. Do you yield, Senator Schwartner? I yield. You recognize Senator West. Okay, Senator Schwartner, first of all, thank you for working on a multitude of issues concerning this particular bill. Okay, and um, with um, all the amendments that we talked about, it's your intention to put those amendments on the bill, correct? There are. I was going to do my layout, but I can, we can talk about the amendments if you'd like to right now. That'd be good. Oh, I understand that. But before I vote to suspend, mm -hmm. I need to know what your intentions are. They are. Yes. As we have discussed and I have discussed repeatedly with, I think, every member on this floor, there are a number, there are four amendments by myself, one by Senator Johnson, one by yourself, and one by Senator Birdwell that will be added to this bill. All right. Thank you. And then Senator Blanco will have an amendment that I believe he will discuss. Senator Hinojosa, for what purpose? Well, uh, the Senator yield for some questions. Do you yield, Senator Schwartner? I yield. You recognize Senator Hinojosa? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, I mean, my question pertain more on uh, some of the issues that we have faced, especially in the past, with some of the concerns and abuses, quite frankly, that were taking place with the previous law under Chapter 313. Uh, and I'll go through several of those uh, concerns that I have, uh, and they were brought to light in the different hearings we held uh, last session. Uh, one, uh, on the jobs. Uh, many of the companies were getting uh, this uh, tax credits and abatements, uh, and they would commit uh, to a certain number of jobs at a certain hourly wage, and then they didn't deliver. Uh, they would waive that, uh, and yet they would get the full benefit of uh, some of the tax credits. How, are, how is that being addressed in House Bill 5? Right. Your, your uh, concerns are, are well, well founded. There were abuses of the prior 313 agreement in which um, guaranteed payments or payments in lieu of taxes, some people called them kickbacks to school districts or to individuals were, were being done. Um, there were also just problems with oversight of the th prior 313 agreement regarding things like the number of jobs that were incented, waivers that were obtained because those jobs were not actually being created. This bill addresses uh, the, the new school tax abatement program. This bill addresses those concerns directly. First of all, it minimizes, it gets rid of completely the guaranteed payments or the, the, the payment in lieu of taxes that school districts were receiving. That is not allowed under this legislation. Further, the job requirement is enhanced and there are, there are more teeth regarding the enforcement of those provisions. There are audits by the state auditor's office of 10% of the eligible projects. There's a biennial a review of the, the, the various projects, and the governor can rescind an agreement uh, at any time. So there are, and also the wage, the wage penalty is doubled in, in the, one of the amendments uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the inability to uh, have the, those jobs that are promised by these various corporations 
in, in when they receive these school abatements. So again, I guess the bottom line is we're putting a lot more teeth, enforcement, and oversight in this new tax incentive program, um, and, and also minimizing the involvement of the school districts. The new approval, pro the application process and approval process is significantly different than the old 313 agreement. Uh, and, and the process itself, you recall some of the concerns that were expressed last session uh, in, in relation to the terms that were made in the agreement with the local school districts. Uh, even if they were ignored, uh, in this uh, House Bill 5, uh, are there provisions to either rescind or terminate uh, or claw back uh, any funding that was provided uh, where the, the business or the corporation uh, did not comply with the terms of the agreement? Yes, the governor can terminate the uh, agreement at any time, and there are clawback provisions in, in the legislation and enforcement actions. And then I know that um, we had several concerns being expressed to you about House Bill 5, and uh, we'll be discussing several amendments that have been discussed, and I think you have pretty much agreed to take some of those amendments. Right. Uh, there, there are amendments, members, uh, and I'll just bring it up now, about the uh, eligible projects, defining it better. Uh, there's amendments that are going to first uh, cut in half the overall abatement amount from 100% abatement of the m and taxes for over a 10 year period to a 50% abatement for those projects, but to incent development in underdeveloped areas and in, in low income areas, rural areas, low population areas, and areas that have been affected by natural disasters. There are these um, opportunity zones which uh, came under President Trump, but these identify these areas, and we're going to give a 75% under this piece of legislation, a 75% uh, tax abatement if that, if that uh, corporation were to locate in an opportunity zone. So I think it drives in, uh, investment and development and jobs into areas of Texas that actually need those investments and jobs. And, and that's important because we, may, we have many areas and regions of a state that many times don't benefit uh, from this type of programs and incentives. Uh, but I know some, one of the amendments uh, will be, there'll be a focus at least on uh, economically depressed areas that are designated by the federal government uh, as opportunity, uh, I forgot the correct terminology, opportunity investment uh, zones. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that uh, that is that correct? That is correct, Senator. These opportunity investment zones, and, and certainly individuals are watching, but they can actually pull up and Google Texas opportunity zones, and, and you can pull up a map of the designated opportunity zones in the state of Texas, and they're designated by census code. Um, and of the census codes, in, in it involves up to 100, 145 counties at the current time, uh, but it includes areas of the Panhandle a large portion of the Rio Grande Valley, a good portion of East Texas, areas along Corpus Christi and the Gulf Coast, and then areas in the far west Texas. Uh, what is conspicuously absent are these opportunity zones in, in major metropolitan areas. And so again, having an increased tax abatement for these opportunity zones will be an incremental factor in a company choosing to locate uh, in one area of Texas or another and they will be offered by this piece of legislation, if it becomes law, an enhanced school abatement if they choose to locate in a part of Texas that uh, has been identified as historically an area that is um, uh, lower population, lower income, more rural, or had been affected by a, a natural disaster. I want to recognize again um, that this Opportunity Zone program was created by the tax cut and Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017 under President Trump and as a federal initiative administered by the U.S. Department of Treasury. And again, low-income communities and certain, certain neighboring areas defined by population census tracts qualify as opportunity zones. Well, and, the, and the number of jobs we set in the agreement as to how many jobs will be created uh, and there will, there will not be a minimum wage type of jobs. Right. There are Specific uh, wage requirements, one of the amendments uh, that will be offered here concerns the payment of good, good wages. 
And I want to recognize Senator Zaffarini uh, bringing this uh, to the attention of myself and others regarding the issues associated with the wages. But the, uh, the, one of the amendments regarding wages has it, of a hundred, has it being required that the wages produced have to be 110% of a sim of the similar of wage of jobs in the in the similar industry, uh, plus those that are W two are actually employed uh, individuals must be provided uh, an opportunity to avail themselves of health care. Well, I look forward to hearing, hearing uh, the amendments and the explanations. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator. Senator Johnson, for what purpose? Questions of the author. Do you yield, Senator Schwartner? I yield. You recognize Senator Johnson. Senator Schwartner, first of all, thanks for the uh, many, many hours of work, uh, not just putting in on the bill, but just in the most recent days in working with various among us uh, here uh, on the floor to craft what is uh, really a, a vastly different form of um, property tax abatement incentive than we've had previously in Texas. You've already had discussions uh, with Senator Hinojosa about something that's, as to my awareness, has never been done in the history of the state of Texas, which is uh, a, a, an investment incentive uh, that gives some sort of priority to areas that perhaps have been left behind in, in historical investment incentives. Um, but I want to be sure because a, no, a number of the members on this floor will be casting a vote to suspend these rules or not suspend these rules uh, based on what is contained in these amendments. Uh, you and I have been through these amendments. Um, am I correct in understanding that the amendments that you and I have discussed are, are the amendments that we're about to put on here? Because those are the amendments that make me vote to suspend because, it, because the work that you've done and that we've all done together make this bill worth the passing the chamber. There are four amendments I'll be offering, and to be very clear, the first amendment has to do with the eligible projects. It removes the requirement or one of the options of being a headquartered for a for-profit for or not, for, not publicly traded company, but it um, broadens the overall categories uh, regarding the eligible projects in the sense of making, there are, there are uh, designations um, called super, um, super sectors, that are tied to a mid-level industry, that are tied to specific NAICS codes. But the eligible projects members, uh, and this is not dissimilar that was in the bill, but I think is more refined, but manufacturing, um, utilities including dispatchable electric generation, natural resources, high-tech and critical infrastructure. Uh, there, are, there are exclusions for battery, wind and solar, as was discussed vigorously in committee. That is, that is one amendment. A second amendment is the amendment regarding cutting in half, essentially the program from 100% abatement to 50% abatement, but doing a 75% abatement for opportunity zone areas of Texas. There's refinement of the ESG language in the second amendment. There's uh, requirements regarding the school districts uh, voting and having an open meeting in the second amendment. Uh, and then there's uh, a requirement with Senator Perry and Senator Birdwell regarding the Legislative Oversight Committee having rural representation on both the House and the Senate side. Uh, so that's, that's the technical amendment. And then the third amendment is a performance bond. I want to recognize Senator West, the, the father of 313 actual agreements in Texas. I understand he carried the original legislation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the uh, performance bond was something that he brought up, which is another layer of protection for these uh, various companies that are incented to come here, if they do not perform, if they fold up and leave Texas, not only can we try to le legally go after them, but this performance bond would be another security mechanism for taxpayers of Texas. And finally, uh, recognizing Senator Zaffarini and others regarding the types of, of jobs and their, how they're tied to wages and, and benefits, the, the Fourth Amendment will address the 100% of the average annual wage for all jobs in the applicable sector for the most recent four quarters, according to the Texas Workforce Commission. And then the, um, that amendment also has to deal with the group health benefit plan uh, being offered for employees of the applicant, not contract laborers, but employees. And then I believe you will have an amendment that makes it the determining factor from a determining factor when it comes to the application process. Uh, and Senator West has a clarifying amendment as well, and Senator Birdwell has one regarding school districts and uh, a notice uh, 15 days before. Those are the amendments I am aware of. 
Uh, th thank you, Senator Schwartner. I do think it's important for people who are deciding their vote right now. Uh, those last couple of amendments, uh, historically one of the most pronounced criticisms of the uh, property tax abatement incentives programs is that we cannot really tell whether or not the corporations that, that benefit from these abatements are in fact making investments because of these abatements. And that's been something we've been looking for. Uh, the amendment that I have and that you and I have worked on together for quite some time uh, would, would give us much more confidence that the people who are awarded, the, the corporate entities that are awarded these abatements really are coming here for that reason. We'll have more discussion there. Uh, you've also addressed wages. You've addressed opportunity zones. Uh, we addressed the scope of uh, entities that will be included, the broad categories in the most 